in this reading, we focus on two major types of financial institutions, banks and insurance companies. What we'll do now is look at a popular approach for analyzing banks, which is the CAMELS approach. The CAMELS approach has six components. So C-A-M-E-L-S stands for the six components. C stands for capital adequacy, which deals with whether a bank has enough capital to absorb losses. The A stands for asset quality. This has to do with the quality of assets, which is based on the credit quality of the assets as well as how well the assets are diversified. M stands for management capabilities. This has to do with management's ability to exploit profitable opportunities while managing risk. E stands for earnings, which has to do with the return on capital as well as quality of earnings. Now, obviously, return on capital is relative to the cost of capital. L is for liquidity. This is a bank's ability to honor current or short-term obligations. S is for sensitivity to market risk, which has to do with a bank's exposure to changes in interest rates, FX rates, security prices, and commodities. Now, to come up with the overall CAMELS rating, we need to assign a rating for each of these components. The rating is on a scale of 1 to 5, where 1 is best and 5 is worst. Now, just imagine that bankers like to play golf. In golf, a lower score is better, and we have the same logic over here. A lower score is better. Over the next few slides, we'll talk about how to evaluate these components. But to illustrate this particular table, let's just assign some ratings. Say that we are evaluating a bank and the capital adequacy is really good. So we'll assign a score of 1. Let's say that the asset quality is average. So we assign a rating of 2.5, which is halfway in between 1 and 5. Let's say that management quality is a little better than average. So we assign 2 over here. The return on capital and quality of earnings is a little worse than average. So we assign 3. The ability to honor current liabilities or the liquidity position is really good. So we assign 1 over here. And let's say that the sensitivity to market risk is low, which is a good thing. And therefore, we assign a 1 over here. The next thing we do is assign a weight to each of these components. Now, this is based on our judgment. We might believe that a particular component is more important in our analysis relative to another component. Now, let's just say that over here, we believe that capital adequacy has a weight of 1. We believe that asset quality is extremely important. So, we allocate a weight of 2 over here. And then, let's say management capabilities gets a weight of 1. Earnings gets a weight of 2. And these final two components get a weight of 1. We then come up with a weighted rating, which is simply a product of these two. So for capital adequacy, we have 1 for this particular bank. Then we have 5, 2, 6, 1, and 1. The next step is to add all these numbers, which gives us 16. We also add all these weights, and that gives us 8. The CAMELS rating then is 16 divided by 8, which is 2. Now, this is the rating based on using these weights. If we had assigned a weightage of 1 to each of these components, then the overall score would have been 10.5, and 10.5 would be divided by 6, and that would have given 1.75. So whether we use 1.75 or 2 depends on our use of weightages. Now, to put the rating number in context, we need to know what's the best possible score and the worst possible score. The best possible score is 1 and the worst possible score is 5. So a rating of 2 is reasonably good because it's closer to 1. We now look at the first component of the CAMELS approach, which is capital adequacy. This is based on the portion of assets funded by capital. So let's look at a real simple balance sheet of a bank. We have the assets here on the left and say that these assets are funded by liabilities and by capital. So liabilities over here, in the context of banks, these will generally be deposits. And then we have capital. Now, 
what the capital adequacy requirement is trying to do is ensure that there is enough capital here in case the value of assets goes down. So just think of C for capital, C for cushion. The capital provides a cushion because if assets start going down in value for any reason, we want a relatively thick cushion. The thicker this cushion, the safer we are. Now, how do we measure this cushion? The cushion can be measured in terms of the capital divided by total assets. The higher this ratio, the better. Now, specifically, here are three ratios. One of those ratios is total capital divided by risk weighted assets. So that's the overall capital divided by assets. Here are two other important ratios. In terms of Basel III requirements, we need to have total capital divided by risk weighted assets at least 8%. So this C over A needs to be at least 8%. If it's more than 8%, that's good. That means that the bank is relatively safe. Total tier one capital divided by risk weighted assets should be at least 6% and common equity tier one capital divided by risk weighted assets should be at least 4.5%. Now here, the question is what is meant by risk weighted assets? What is common equity tier one capital? What's total tier one capital and what's total capital? Let's start with risk weighted assets. Here, we need to recognize that not all assets are created equal. Some assets are more risky, other assets are less risky. Cash, for example, has no risk. Therefore, the risk weightage for cash will be zero. On the other hand, corporate bonds are relatively risky, so they will have a higher risk weightage. At this point, we don't need to get into exactly what weightage should be assigned to what asset, but we need to recognize the principle that the more risky an asset, the higher the weightage, and those specific weightages might vary from country to country. So in any case, risk-weighted assets refers to a value of a bank's assets which are weighted based on risk. Now coming to the different types of equity. Common equity tier 1 capital includes common stock, issuance surplus related to common stock, retained earnings, OCI and certain adjustments. So when we generally say common equity, that is what we are talking about over here. Then we have other tier 1 capital. This includes instruments which meet criteria such as the instruments should be subordinate to deposits and other debt obligations. There should be no fixed maturity. And if the instrument makes interest or dividend payments, these payments should be at a bank's discretion. An example here might be that a bank issues preferred stock and the dividend payments on the preferred stock depend on the discretion of the bank. So that would be other tier one capital. Common equity tier one capital plus other tier one capital is total tier one capital. So that's the item over here in the second ratio. This needs to be at least 6% according to Basel III. And then we have tier two capital, which must meet this criteria. The capital must be subordinate to deposits and to general creditors of the bank. The maturity must be at least five years. When we combine the total tier one capital with tier two capital, we have total capital, which is here in the third ratio. The Basel III requirement is that this should be at least 8%. In terms of assigning a capital adequacy rating, we can say that the higher the ratios, the better. Coming now to the second component, which is asset quality. This is based on credit quality and diversification. A bank's credit policies and overall risk management processes will impact asset quality. In terms of major asset categories, we have loans, investments and in securities issued by other entities. So this is where a bank might invest in stocks or bonds. And then the third category is highly liquid financial instruments. These would be government T-bills or other money market instruments. Now, in terms of evaluating these three categories, let's start with loans. The quality of loans depends on the credit worthiness of borrowers. If credit policies are tight and loans are only issued to very credit worthy borrowers, then the quality here will be relatively high. When evaluating loans, we also need to estimate the adequacy of judgments for expected loan losses. 
If we do an analysis and the expected loan losses are high, but those losses are not built into the loan values, then that will be a cause for concern. That would indicate that the quality of loans is weak. In terms of investments and other securities, these are measured differently depending on how they are categorized. We might have instruments that are measured based on amortized cost. So their value does not change on the balance sheet. The value shown is the amortized cost. In evaluating these instruments, we need to determine whether there has been any impairment and if so, whether that impairment has been factored into the value that's shown on the books. Then we have fair value through other comprehensive income. Here an asset is shown at fair value, but unrealized gains and losses go through OCI. Here we need to analyze whether the unrealized gains and losses are being measured well or not. And finally, fair value through profit and loss. This is relatively easy. All the unrealized gains and losses also go through the income statement. Overall asset quality can be evaluated based on composition of assets as well as credit quality. When we talk about composition of assets, we can look at different asset types as a percentage of total assets. So we can look at highly liquid financial instruments. These tend to be relatively safe. So we can look at the ratio of these highly liquid instruments to overall assets. If this ratio is relatively high, then that would imply high quality. We can also look at loans relative to total assets. If the ratio of loans to total assets is high, and then within loans, if we have a high percentage of risky loans, then that would imply low credit quality. For most banks, loans tend to be a significant percentage of overall assets. So these loans need to be carefully analyzed. Specifically, we should look at the allowance for loan losses relative to non-performing loans. The allowance for loan losses is a balance sheet item. This is a contra account, sort of like allowance for bad debt. And this is also fairly subjective. We want to compare this with non-performing loans which is a less subjective item. If this ratio is low, then that would be a cause for concern because that would imply that the allowance for loan losses is not sufficient. We can also look at the provision for loan losses relative to net loan charge-offs. The provision for loan losses is an income statement item. And if this ratio is low, that would imply that the provision for loan losses is not enough, which again would be a cause for concern. The third component is management capability. This refers to a bank management's ability to identify and exploit profitable opportunities while managing risk. Other factors to consider here are governance structure, compliance with laws and regulations, internal controls, transparency of management communications, and financial reporting quality. The fourth component is earnings. This refers to a bank's return on invested capital relative to cost of capital. The higher the return on invested capital, the better. Most banks have three major earnings components, net interest income, services income, and trading income. When evaluating a bank's earnings, we need to study the composition of earnings. So of these three components, the one that is typically most stable is net interest income. So if most of the earnings are coming from here, that would be a good sign. Trading income tends to be the most volatile. So if in a given year, trading income is high relative to the other components, then that would be a cause for concern. And this is related to earnings quality. Earnings quality has to do with sustainability of earnings. If earnings are sustainable, that means quality is high. On the other hand, if a significant component of earnings are coming from non-recurring items, then that would imply that earnings quality is low. We are also concerned with earnings trend. Ideally, what we would want is a positive trend. In evaluating earnings, we should carefully look at loan impairment allowances. Now, if loan impairment allowances have been underestimated, then that would be a cause for concern because later on, as the loan impairment allowances are recognized, that would drive earnings down. We also need to be concerned with fair value estimates. Here we need to recognize the three levels of fair value hierarchy. So when an asset is shown at fair value, it might be level one, two, or three. 
with level 1 there is essentially no subjectivity with level 3 there is substantial subjectivity because the inputs for that asset are unobservable so we are basically estimating fair value our job as an analyst is to determine how well a bank is estimating fair value if a bank's estimate of fair value is higher than what we believe it should be then that would be a cause for concern because this would imply potential impairments in the future which would have a negative impact on earnings. The fifth component is liquidity. This has to do with the amount of liquid assets relative to near-term expected cash flows. And there are two major considerations when evaluating liquidity. The first is exactly what we just said, which is liquid assets relative to near-term expected cash flows. The relevant ratio is the liquidity coverage ratio, which is highly liquid assets divided by expected cash flows in a certain period. According to Basel III, the minimum requirement here is 100%, which means that we need to have liquid assets at least equal to the expected cash outflows. The other important aspect is the stability of a bank's funding sources. Here, the relevant ratio is the net stable funding ratio, which is available stable funding divided by required stable funding. The required stable funding is based on the composition and maturity of assets, whereas available stable funding is based on the composition and maturity of liabilities and capital. Now, in this case, equity capital will be considered the most stable form of funding. Here again, the Basel III framework requires a minimum of 100%, which means that this, the available stable funding, must be at least equal to the required stable funding. There are at least two other factors to consider. One is the concentration of funding. And here we are concerned with how many sources of funding we have. If we just have one source of funding, that would be a major cause for concern because if that source dries up, then there would be a major liquidity issue. So if we have several sources of funding, that is a positive. Another factor is contractual maturity mismatch. Here we look at the maturity of liabilities, such as deposits, relative to the maturity of assets, such as bank loans. Ideally, we want to minimize this mismatch. A larger point here is that a bank's failure to honor a current liability could have a major systemic impact. So if depositors come to the bank and want to withdraw their money and the bank can't meet that requirement, there will be a bank run and that can have a significant negative impact on the economy. We now come to the sixth and final component, which is sensitivity to market risk. This deals with how adverse market movements impact a bank's earnings and financial position. There are several measures for market risk, but the one that this reading focuses on is value at risk. A bank will typically have a trading portfolio and a credit portfolio. So we calculate the VAR for both of these portfolios. VAR stands for value at risk and the lower the VAR, the better. So if VAR is low, that means that the sensitivity to market risk is low. Now, market risk is the exposure to changes in market prices, such as interest rates, exchange rates, equity prices, and commodity prices. The exposure to changes in market prices arises because of a mismatch between deposits and loans. So deposits are liabilities, loans are assets. A mismatch between liabilities and assets is what creates an exposure for a bank. So what are the different sources of mismatches? The biggest source is maturity. So this is also called a duration gap where there is a difference in maturity or duration of liabilities and assets. Mismatches can also come because of repricing frequency. So if liabilities and assets have different frequencies at which they are repriced, here liabilities and assets might have different reference rates and currency. This is where liabilities and assets are measured based on different currencies. But again, the most significant item here typically is maturity.